There are very rare and few occasions that my love for the railways and my love for Titanic merge. And one of the places it did was in the place I least expected. When I first stepped foot onto the luxury carriage affectionately known as the 12-wheeler at Hemsby Railway, imagine my surprise when I saw a four-foot poster depicting the White Star Line and the Titanic. Little did I know that I had just stepped aboard Bruce Ismay's director's saloon and it's him and his connection to the railways we're going to look at today. Born in Lancashire on the 12th of December 1862, Bruce Ismay was pretty much born into his job. His father, Thomas Ismay, was already a senior partner in the founding company of the White Star Line and his mother was the daughter of a shipbuilder. Bruce had a privileged life and a top-notch education, first learning in schools in Harrow and then sent to France to be tutored for a year. After schooling, there was little doubt what Bruce's path would be, and Bruce worked as an apprentice under his father, learning about the fine art of running a large multinational company before taking a tour around the world. It was a life very few could imagine, and even more wanted to dream of. Bruce settled in New York City, where he wanted to grow the White Star Line. The White Star Line was originally a goods company shipping cargo around the world, but over time it began to ship passengers. Bruce recognised this as a golden opportunity and worked as an agent promoting the business within the city. While over there, Bruce fell in love and started a family. In 1891, Bruce came back to the UK to help in his father's company and take up the ranks of partner in the family business and the White Star Line prospered. In 1899, Thomas Ismay passed away, leaving Bruce as chairman. By now, rival companies such as Inman and Cunard were pushing for the coveted blue ribbon for crossing the Atlantic in the fastest time, but Bruce decided to pull out of the race entirely. He knew that speed wasn't everything, instead he focused his concentration on comfort and luxury. In 1902, the new Celtic class was launched, which were packed from bow to stern with comfort and passengers in mind. Bruce wasn't done, and although the Celtic class liners were the largest in service at the time, passengers were still looking to the faster ships to get them to the Americas, especially the steerage class, which is where the majority of the profit was laying. He had to think of something extra special to keep the passengers happy enough that they would not mind staying aboard an extra day or two. His answer came to him in 1908. He approached Harland and Wolfe and Thomas Andrews with a view to make three new superliners. These liners would be the largest vessels to have ever been built. The ships would be fast, not record-breaking fast like the Cunard line, but fast enough to feel the wind on your face. The most important aspect of these ships was the care and comfort of the passengers. All the passengers. In a move that was practically unheard of at the time, third-class passengers, which were normally confined to the mass bunks at the bow and stern of the ship, would also receive such comforts. Single men and women were still segregated, but provisions were made for families to have cabins with basic amenities. For the first time, food and drink would be provided on board and served to the third class in a standard dining room. They would also have a smoking and general room, and finally their own promenade deck at the back of the ship. The second and first class rooms would be so lavishly decorated that many likened the ship to be a floating hotel. There were gyms, tennis courts, libraries, Turkish baths and even a saltwater swimming pool which was warm to the passengers' desired temperature. Bruce also wanted to try out new safety features which included new watertight doors. The doors would seal shut a compartment of the hull should the hull be breached allowing the ship to travel safely. Bruce trusted this technology blindly and ordered that Andrew's designs be changed. 48 lifeboats that should have easily sat every single passengers on the new superliners 
were reduced down to a mere 16, the absolute minimum allowed by the Board of Trade based on the ship's tonnage. The extra lifeboats were, in Ismay's opinion, a waste of deck space and a ghastly reminder to passengers of what could never happen. All of this, Ismay hoped, would entice the passengers to travel with him. In 1911, the first of these gigantic ships was complete. Olympic's first maiden voyage under the command of Edward J. Smith went without a hitch, and while no record breaker, gained a reputation for what exactly Bruce had hoped for. He hoped that her sister, Titanic, would also get the same notoriety. In 1912, Bruce watched on proudly as Titanic completed her sea trials and prepared herself for her first journey out at sea. Ismay had a tradition of being on board with the ships on their maiden voyage, mostly to oversee the journey and be on board in case of any trouble. Titanic will be no exception. We do not know exactly what happened in those four days while aboard Titanic. And while there's much speculation about Ismay's dealings with the senior crew, in the years after the sinking, some first-class passengers testified that Bruce was putting pressure on the captain to push the ship faster. While many do not doubt this conversation took place, it's impossible to know for sure. Captain Edward J. Smith was a favourite amongst the elite and wealthy, with many dubbing him as the millionaire's captain. To have him shown as responsible for the disaster would tarnish his good memory. It was also noted that while Ismay was in a position of considerable power, he was still, in the captain's and the crew's eyes, a passenger. No passenger, not even the owner of the ship, can outrank or give orders to a captain. It also made no sense to to Bruce's business structure. Bruce had made it clear many years before that he had no interest in being the fastest ship and knew that Titanic was not a record breaker. So why push the engines? No one knows what Bruce Ismay was doing the exact moment the iceberg hit. Rumours were that he had retired for the evening like many of the first class passengers. He knew though the importance of moving quickly. He knew there was not enough lifeboats, and he knew that the damage to the ship was terminal. Acting quickly, he helped the crewmen with the lifeboats and started to load women and children on board. It was difficult, as many did not want to leave the safety of the ship, but Bruce used his power and influence to convince them. He loaded passenger after passenger and saved many lives. At the last moment, Bruce jumped into collapsible sea, just 20 minutes before the Titanic sank beneath the waves, taking 1,500 passengers and crew with her. Bruce, completely consumed by both guilt and despair, turned away from the great ship and sobbed as she disappeared. In the first light of daybreak, collapsible sea was recovered by Carpathia. After the captain realised who he was, Ismay was confined to the doctor's cabin. Bruce was destroyed and inconsolable and had to be given medication to help his condition. He locked himself away from the world and refused to eat anything solid. Many on board sympathised with him, but those on the mainland were not so sympathetic, branding him a coward and a brute. Although Bruce would be cleared of any wrongdoing from the disaster, Both him and his reputation would never recover. He became depressed and moved to Ireland to a large cottage away from the hustle and bustle and gossip. While he refused to ever speak of Titanic, he did donate a large sum of money to the widows of the disaster and help pay insurance claims made by relatives of those lost. This was lost on many who saw the payments as an expected part of his role within the company. Following his discredited reputation and not wanting it to tarnish with the Bright Star Line, Bruce decided to step down as chairman less than a year after the sinking. Many assume that this was the end of Bruce's story, as little was heard from him after this, but it's simply not true. Bruce certainly was not the same man that boarded Titanic in April 1912, but he was still busy. 
He was still very active in maritime activities and while was not chairman, was still on the board. He worked for the Liverpool and London Steam Ship Protection and Indemnity Association Limited, dealing with insurance claims. He commissioned a new ship called the Mersey, which was designed to help train new cadets and help raise several funds to help the families of lost seamen. It was well established even before the days of Titanic that the White Star Line and the London and North Western Railway were very close partners. In fact, Ismay was on the railway's board of directors. It made sense that a collaboration between the railway and the liners would grant both companies a guaranteed revenue. Goods trains could help provide materials that would help build the ships and then bring and take passengers right to the dockside. In 1923, the LNWR was swallowed into the powerhouse of the London, Midland and Scottish Railway, but Ismay was still in power as director. He represented the LMS on several fronts, including the Birmingham Canal Navigations, the Manchester Ship Canal and the more charitable Widows and Orphans Society, among other businesses. While he was busy, he still led a solitary personal life away from the grandeur, fame and position, preferring to fish in his private stream near the cottage when he wasn't working. Of course, his work meant a lot of meetings, and what better way to travel than by rail? Bruce and the board of directors commissioned a special saloon designed to accommodate them while they were on the move. The carriage was created in 1913. It was a commission with two six-wheel bogies that were highly unusual, but it allowed for the carriage to have a smoother ride. The carriage allowed for the directors to travel around their network in comfort and inspect the route. After the amalgamation of the railways, firstly to the Big Four and then to British Rail, the carriage was moved to the Norfolk Railway, where she remained for many years. In 2003, Stephen Middleton of Stately Trains heard of the carriage and made a move to purchase it. He was successful and he brought the carriage back to Yorkshire, where it went through an extensive overhaul, bringing the carriage back to its former glory. It has now become a mainstay of the fleet and used mostly in the summer season, attached to the standard set of carriages and used as the setting for the railway's afternoon teas. Ismay never got over the tragedy of Titanic and his family forbade the topic when they had gatherings. The only time he ever spoke of the disaster that night was when his young granddaughter innocently asked him if he had ever been shipwrecked. His reply was simple. Yes, he replied. I was once on a ship which was believed to be unsinkable. In the 1930s, stress and depression began to take its toll on Bruce's health, and after a diagnosis of diabetes in 1936, he had to undergo a leg amputation, forcing him into a wheelchair. In 1937, Bruce collapsed due to a massive stroke, which he never gained consciousness, and three days later he passed with his family surrounding him. Yesterday marked 110 years since the Titanic sank, and while we remember those lost, it does lead the question, was history fair to Bruce Ismay? Bruce always retained an air of guilt and never forgave himself, but he had acted within the confines of the law at the time. Sadly, many movies, even today, portray Ismay as a coward, a villain, and generally unlikable. Unfortunately, it's impossible to know the answer, but there is no denying he was an extraordinary man who dared to try and put a palace on the ocean and who paved the way for better facilities for everyone, no matter the class, to have.